quickly, I watched the, the, the uh, steering wheel turn and I was off. Oh, there happened to be an exit right before the parking lot, before the traffic jam. I took it off, off. I was guided to the side road, da da da. I made it down to the city, the gathering, no delay. Uh, well, it's not a parking, it's not a traffic jam unless you're in it. Uh, and when you're not in it, you know, it's nice to be guided like off of the highway before the parking jam. I've also had times where I've been in, like in Colombia, and I was in a, a, what we call a traffic jam where nothing was moving. And, but again, when you're in the present moment, there's nowhere to go and there's no place to be. You're it. Uh, you're always at the right place at the right time because you're a child of God and you're not bound by time and space. So you really don't need to get stressed. You know, the script is written. Somebody, has anybody seen Slumdog Millionaire, the yes. Academy Award winning movie? It's all about destiny. We came from the ancient tradition of Veda Vedanta, you know, it is written. It's what the Course teaches as well. But once you start to see everything's written, then you realize you're, you're always at the right place at the right time. That'll cut down on your stress level big time. Uh, if you always are aware that you're in the right place at the right time, even that's, you're, you're actually beyond space and time, but it just seems in this world that you just relax into this state of, uh, of destiny. So, uh, you know, I was like watching Slumdog Millionaire, it was like a mystical experience, just seeing the, the perfection of everything. Okay, now, we're flowing along here, we're just cruising along. Would you like to sing a song for us all? Okay, let's do that here. The song or anything? Be gentle with yourself. Now, we were just singing this song, I think it was yesterday, and we all were crying. So, if you have little tissues, you may need this because you're just about ready to forgive yourself in this song for everything and see how loving and beautiful you are. And, and it's really touching when you do this because it's like you're, you've just been waiting to do this. And so, and Helena will sing it. And if you all really relate to it, we might pass out some, uh, some lyrics and all do it together. <laughs> it may not be a dry eye in the, the place though. It always gets me every time.
Inside we're all the same There's a light that tries to shine out In everything we say and do Outside it's just a game But the roles we sometimes play by Won't let the light shine through Let the light shine yourself from anything that's been holding you back. Because how many of us get hard on ourselves, especially when you go on the spiritual journey and you, you beat yourself up for thinking of what you should be or how far along you should be. And the Spirit is just loving you just as you are right now. There it is. So I will pass out. I'm give them to that side of the room, and I'll pass them out over here. This is the song we just heard. Inside, we're all the same because we all come from the same source. We're all the same love and the same energy. And it's vibrating in us. But it has to pour through us. It has to be extended before we re remember that it's who we are. And then this society, this world that seems to be so real with all these conflicts and problems, that's the game. When we get all caught up in the game, then we forget who we are on the inside. We just get distracted. And that's why this world was made, is like a big hall of mirrors, a big distracting device to try to keep us from knowing who we are. And then the more we get wise, we get to this trick. It's like we're not going to buy into the game. Yeah.
capital seems to roll with all they had before. Be gentle with yourself, sometimes we get the grace, sometimes we make mistakes. Be gentle with yourself, don't kick yourself around, should you fall to the ground. Be gentle with yourself, just step back into stride. Touch to you inside. The inside we're all the same. There's a light that tries to shine out in everything we say and do. Outside it's just a game, but the rules we sometimes play by won't let the light shine through. Underneath this, there's a lot of wisdom. 
Whether you come in from a scientific perspective or a spiritual perspective, from the, the Course, Advaita Vedanta, or one of thousands of different spiritual pathways, that everybody knows that love is the answer. Even the Beatles. <laughs> all you need is love. You know, love is all you need. I mean, that was a beautiful song that everybody resonates with. And people who have, who have come through this world, they'll say, well, what about things like sin? Uh, what about things like mistakes? Uh, aren't there some big mistakes? I mean, it's one thing to make small mistakes. Uh, and some people will say, well, you know, it's just, it's just a little teeny lie. It's just a little white lie. You really didn't, it's not so bad. You shouldn't feel so bad. Maybe a little bad, but you shouldn't feel so bad. You maybe have a little guilt, but just, you shouldn't feel such intense pain and shame and suffering. And the reason you can be gentle with yourself is to the spirit, you really are innocent. To the spirit, you really have done nothing wrong, ever. Now, we have to kind of go a little bit deeper with this because it seems like human beings make a lot of mistakes. You know, in fact, there's some songs that are written, you know, you're only human, you were born to make mistakes. And we might say that human beings seem to make a lot of mistakes and a lot of errors. Trial, uh, temptations, errors, and then hopefully growing from those errors and mistakes. What about the question of evil? What about the question of sin? Well, it's kind of like this. It's like when you go to sleep at night and you dream dreams, you react and respond to those dreams as if they're real. That's why you feel uh, the same emotion when you're watching that. You might be able to close that door to the cafeteria. So we can... and, and when you're dreaming a dream, you know, and you feel your heart pounding or you feel afraid, uh, like if a monster is chasing you, uh, or if you seem to fall off a cliff and you feel your stomach doing somersaults and you feel fear rising up and everything, it's because you're convinced in the reality of the dream. Uh, you know, if you were in a state of what we might call lucid dreaming, which is simply being in a state where you're aware that you're dreaming, it could get kind of funny. Uh, you know, the monster could be big, green, dark, ugly monster and everything, and you could just have a good belly laugh and go, whoa, what a dream, look what I did this time, you know, look at the size of that monster and everything. If you were aware that you were dreaming, but it seems like when you go to sleep at night, you're just not aware that you're dreaming. It's, it just seems real. It seems like it's really happening. Some people tell me that I can smell it, that my dreams are very three-dimensional and, and brilliant colors, and it sometimes seems even more real than, than the world. Well, what I'm teaching you is that when you go through your everyday life, that the world that we see during the daytime is a dream as well and you're still reacting and responding to the images as if they're really happening. And it's kind of like Shakespeare, you know, all the world's a stage and everyone must play their part. When you fall asleep and forget your divine reality, you forget that you are one with God, that you are the living Christ, or that you are pure energy and pure spirit. When you forget that and you get caught up into sleeping and dreaming, and you take those dreams seriously, problems can get very serious from that perspective. You know, financial problems, health crises, problems in relationships, grievances, uh, disagreements, arguments. You know, when you have an argument with a close friend or with a relative, it's like somebody just stuck a pin in your heart. You know, the guilt can be intense. You know, you finally, maybe you let the anger up, and you say, okay, let him have it. I'm, I'm not going to be a doormat. I'm not just going to stand by. I'm going to let it up. But how do you feel after you express anger? Guilty. I mean, even, even if it feels momentarily good to like really let him have it and blast him, then we feel guilt. Because this ego in our mind is trying to trick us. It tells us you can get it out. You know, get the pain out. 
take it out on somebody else, but it doesn't tell you that when you take it out on somebody else, you're really just projecting your anger and your guilt, and then you feel worse. Like firing a, a ray gun into a mirror. Ah, let him have it. And then it just zaps you uh, because you're really not forgiving. You're not letting it go. So, what I'm going to say is, we're not trying to say that, that anything like uh, cruelty or killing or suffering, the things, you know, the, the Ten Commandments talked about, about thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. You, when you really start to look at things like ethics and morality, you start to see that no two people see the same world, and even when you talk about morality, what's moral for one person in a different culture, in a different society, doesn't go for the same thing. That there's no agreement on ethics or morality. That the only experience we can find where there's a universal agreement is this inner love and peace that we have that's covered over by all these false concepts and judgments. And that's why we got to let them go. The problem is, is that it seems like if I let go of all my judgments, uh, who will look out for me? Who will take care of me? Won't this, this world just swallow me up? You know, like if I'm so simple and innocent, won't, won't I be like Bambi? Uh, uh, will I be like Bambi the deer, you know, and, and someone will come along and shoot me? Uh, or come along and, and hunt me and, and torture me? And what I'm here to say is that when you really do the inner work and you let go of these judgments, that you are strength, that you are invulnerable, that you are no longer at the mercy of anything or anyone. Uh, you still render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, you know. When I come to uh, Australia on a trip like this, uh, they say, David, you've got to get an electronic visa. Okay. Uh, now I've got so many friends that, that they, they say, don't worry about it, David, just go do what you do. I'll, I'll register for you online. And I said, do you, do you get some kind of number? No, once you're registered, you're registered. You just get in the country, pay whatever it is, $25 or whatever. You still have to seem to do things. You know, I still have a passport. Uh, I, when I first was told I would be traveling, I said, do you have to get one of those thingamajiggies, you know, do you really have to? And they said, yes, it's called a passport, David. It's got a name, passport. You get it for 10 years in the United States, and then you, know, you don't have to think about it. And then I, I did have to think about it, only because I got it stamped so many times that, that the people would tell me at the borders, you've got to get more pages uh, in your passport. So I did. Just sent away and got more pages. So, yes, uh, you, you still seem to use money, you know, you go places and people for tickets or for buying food or for doing whatever, it's just that, that you aren't identified with the doer. So I don't feel like I have to earn the money or spend it. It's just like a whoosh of feathers happening, uh, you know, like swirling feathers in the wind. Uh, it's not very straining at all, uh, you know. They tell me, Currencies are collapsing, but I don't know, it just I, it doesn't matter to me, you know, the stock markets are crashing, and this is annuities, and this and this. I mean, I, I read Lesson uh, 135 in the Course in Miracles, and Jesus said, a healed mind is relieved of the belief that it must plan. How cool! Relieved of the belief that it must plan, I have a degree in urban planning. I spent five years uh, learning how to plan and project into the future, you know, for cities, infrastructure, and communications, and transportation, and all this and this. I did find that most of what I learned in university, I had to unlearn. Uh, as Robert Folger wrote a book, you know, everything I needed to know I, I learned in kindergarten. Uh, yes, yes, remember kindergarten? Don't, don't take other little children's toys, you know, be respectful, put your toys away, clean up, have a nice snack, and maybe get a nap, a little siesta. <laughs> Wouldn't that get you through? <laughs> I mean, uh, the problem comes with first grade. <laughs> 
And I've had people that bring their children over to me, and I'll be sitting there with a little uh, first grader, and we'll be having to talk about kindergarten, and then the, the child's like, yeah, it was cool, we had the cookies and the nuts, and I say, how's it going now? And they say, oh, it's terrible. Um, I've got homework. We're like, homework? Who assigns homework? What? God is not involved with homework. God will get you home and get you out of the work. Um, but, I mean, I've had a, a, there's a young woman over in the Canary Islands that she came to, uh, to my gatherings and she took off school because her, her mother is in the Course in Miracles and so is her grandmother. And so they let her take off school and they gave some excuse and so forth. She traveled around the islands with me, listening to my spiritual music like I had playing there, laughing, playing, singing. I was the spiritual DJ. I brought all my, my CDs and this, this girl, the grandmother and the mother, rejoiced. We were all driving around uh, these islands, the Grand Canary Island, singing and rejoicing and everything. And so finally the girl came to my gathering and she started drawing a little drawing, pencil drawing, and she drew uh, she drew Adam and Eve, and she drew a snake, and she drew a garden and a tree with one rotten apple. And it was a black apple that was there. And I, I asked her, she didn't speak any English, but I, her parents, her mother translated, and I said, is this the Garden of Eden? She said, yes. And then I, I noticed, I looked around, and there on one side of the paper was only one mathematical sign, which was the infinity sign. And I said, is that God? And she said, yes. And then over on the other side was the Adam and Eve and the snake and the, the apple. And as I spent time with her, she was a great artist. She was like a little uh, Picasso, spectacular, maybe like 10, maybe 11, 12 years old, spectacular paintings. And when I spent time with her, she said, whenever she said the word homework, her face crinkled up. She got a frown on her face. This happy child, every time homework was mentioned. And then I said, what don't you like about the homework? And she went, mathematique, mathematique. She, ooh, she winced with it. And I was able to talk with her, and the only symbol in all of mathematique that she could relate to only symbol was the infinity sign. She couldn't relate to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Multiplication, division, definitely not. She couldn't relate to division. Addition, subtraction. And yet, the little Picasso could, could like paint these glorious paintings. And so after I spent some time with her, she actually came to me and she said, David, Will you talk to my mother and my father, please, and really implore them that I would like to retire <laughs> from school? And I said, of course, I will do that. I will talk to them. Your mother, your grandmother, or Course in Miracles. Nothing I see means anything. I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. Nothing, zilch, nada, out of there. We don't need more learning. We don't need more education. <laughs> it's just another brick in the wall. I mean, it's like, hey, teacher, leave those kids alone. Yes, you got it. I went and talked to the mother and everything, and, and I said, in practical terms, she is like a little professional painter. It's like a little Einstein, you know, a little boy genius. She's, she's like a little Picasso, and she can sell her paintings for you, for the whole family. <laughs> she can help support the whole family. Some of the jobs that they had, you know, weren't bringing it, but these were really, I mean, we're talking major paintings. And I said, she's happier when she's just in the flow, and this art is expressing through her. She has got what she needs. And, and education, I could speak from the wisdom of having gone through. Yes, I went through grade school and junior high, high school, and 10 years, including graduate school, and studied everything. So it wasn't like I was down on education. I mean, I spent my whole 
spent 20 years of my life immersed in the educational system. So I don't have any kind of animosity towards it or anything, but, but I do see that the wisdom of the Spirit and giving my life over to the Spirit and becoming intuitive, that solved all my problems. It wasn't the education, you know, how we keep throwing money in education. You know, for centuries now, there's been a belief that education would solve the problems of the world. We would stop war with education. We would stop disease with education. We would stop every kind of social discord with education, with better educational efforts and everything. And it wasn't until I got into the Course where Jesus says, Oh, the problem is learning. You have overlearned an insane world. You have overlearned and reinforced absolute insanity. And you never stopped to pause while you were doing all this overlearning to, to question, is this really what I should be using my mind's energy for, all this learning? And I went 10 years of university. It's like when I'm working with this little 12 year old, I'm like, let's save time. Let's, let's get down to the, to the core. Let's get about the unlearning together, you know. And if, if I didn't know about divine providence, I mean, I see now, my resume doesn't bring me money, these paper strips. Uh, my resume doesn't uh, put anything in the bank. Uh, I was even told by the Spirit to delete my resume many, many years ago, that I carefully built up my CV, my grade point averages, all the jobs I did. I mean, I really followed all the ways of the world out, and it got me depression, frustration, anxiety, worry. You know, we know a lot of intelligent people. There's a lot of intelligent people that have really followed this ways, the world's ways, but are they happy? You know? Are the PhDs happy? Are the, the ones that have, have carried it out? Really? You know? Do you meet many PhDs that they say, my heart is open, it's flowing, let's do a divine spirit dance, uh, or something like this. Uh, there are, we, we have them, they're, they're rare. <laughs> but, but you find that, like for example, I had a friend Dorothy who I met, and Dorothy's been listening to the Holy Spirit speak to her since she was like about nine years old. And I met her when she was 58. And she had so many miraculous stories to share from her life. And I asked her specifically about A Course in Miracles. I said, you know, that it's 1,200 pages and it's got a lot of big words in it. Three or four syllable words. These were psychology professors that put this book together. And I said, what do you do when you reach a word that you don't understand? I mean, most of us would probably look it up in the dictionary if we were really curious. but. But when you don't even have a high school education and you're reading three and four syllable words, not on every chapter, but maybe we'll say every, every page, there's three and four syllable words, what do you do? And she just laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. And when she finally quit laughing, she said, well, the Holy Spirit gives me a smaller word that means the same thing as the big word. <laughs> oh, well, so much for education. Uh, we don't need no education. <laughs> no. We really, my biological mother was a teacher. Uh, I, I spent years in teacher's college working with teachers, training teachers, and now I actually work with Course in Miracles students and teachers all over the world. I mean, I'm in contact with hundreds of them all over the world in many different cultures and many different languages. And, you know, the teachers, they just, you know, they say girls just want to have fun. Uh, the teachers want to just feel the peace and love and joy and happiness. They don't really care if they can memorize a book that's 1,200 pages long and quote scripture. They want the peace. They want the experience. They come to me, they watch YouTube videos and Google and Yahoo videos that I've done of, of teaching sessions. Uh, some of them, like Les, Les watched four, or listened to 400 hours and then did it again, twice. <laughs> Your son is very persistent. <laughs> and, and yet, people will actually tune in and they listen to it and they go over and over, but they really want an experience. They don't want to become like scholars at scripture. Remember the scribes and the Pharisees in the Bible that could quote 
the scripture, but they really didn't, they know the letter of the law, but they didn't know the spirit. They were still judgmental, kind of condemning people. We don't want to condemn anyone. We want to be totally accepting of our brothers and sisters. So it has been a very interesting journey for me, and I have had to realize that, that becoming intuitive was going to answer all my, my questions. And so I don't have any worries and concern over the financial system or whether I'll be provided for. I haven't had a job since 1991. Um, what that means is I haven't received a paycheck uh, since 1991. So this isn't kind of a new thing for me, like I'm just kind of out there flying by the seat of my pants and just on a wing and a prayer and hoping it works. Oh, it works. Uh, that's, that's 18 years ago. Uh, and I was told very specifically from the voice within, that's the last job that you will have in the world. Now you're mine. And you will be used in ways that you can't even fathom. So don't even try to figure it out. Don't ask for a, a five-year plan or a two-year plan. I'll give it to you moment by moment. Go here, go there, do this, say that. Uh, call so-and-so, go to the hospital, visit so-and-so, you know. Practical instructions. We all have an inner voice within us, and, and it's only our willingness to listen that tunes us into it. It's speaking to us all the time, all through the day. It knows our greatest good. It's real. Uh, believe me, when everything else passes away in this world, and when you have nothing left, and the images even dissolve away, there'll be this inner voice that will say, well done, rest. Now we rest in love. Uh, the voice will still be there for one last hurrah before you move back into abstraction, the love and light of God, where you exist in perfect oneness, and there is no doer. There's nothing to be done. You, you could say your home is isness. <laughs> you find me, it's like, welcome home to the isness. Uh, and, and the other thing is, you don't have to die to go to heaven. Uh, that's another sneaky uh, thing. We think, you know, they put it on the, the uh, uh, gravestones, RIP, rest in peace. Nobody who dies rests in peace. <laughs> I mean, if you die, and you believe you can die, that's a hell of a situation. Uh, you feel like you're in hell. God didn't create death. Uh, and you don't reach life, eternal life, through death. You reach life through forgiveness. Forgiveness is another word for resurrection. You simply resurrect and, and realize your eternity, you know, by surrendering your grievances. It's really that simple. So when people tell me, oh, they suffered so. They were suffering up until their last breath. But finally the Lord took them, and now they rest in eternal bliss. Yeah, that's, if that's the case, why don't everybody just go out and commit suicide? Let's get this thing over with uh, in a hurry. <laughs> Mass suicide, well that'll get you to eternal bliss, huh? If everybody just has to die to get there, let's get Hitler back out of here, and Mussolini, and, and Osama. We can, we can get this thing done in a hurry. Get this time space thing over with. Everybody laughs because it's like, no, you don't you don't make it the kamikaze trip back to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus didn't say anything about kamikaze. You know, he didn't say the kingdom of heaven is within and you gotta kill yourself to get there. You know, he's saying, live, live with me, think with me, be with me, laugh with me. Don't take it serious. My kingdom is not of this world. I'm calling you out of the world. Okay, good, you got some careful instruction. <laughs> uh, I'm not calling you to the Himalayas, I'm not calling you to live in a cave. Isn't it great that we live in a day and age where you can practice your spirituality wherever you seem to be? You know, you don't have to go live in a cave. You don't have to go live in the woods. You, you can practice right where you seem to be. God will meet you right where you seem to be and lift you up, and literally lift you up. Isn't it great that you don't have to do penance to reach the kingdom of heaven? Isn't it great that you don't have to sacrifice anything? People say, well, we've heard David about the saints and the mystics, and it sounds pretty nasty. I mean, yeah, St. John of the Cross, dark night of the soul, you know, I gotta go through that. 
what have I got to give up? Oh, what have I got to give up? We have good talks about that. Les, Les and I, Les is like saying, is it possible to be happy without uh, making like a radical change in your lifestyle? What if you had a radical change in your thinking and your, your worldly life was pretty much the same, you know? You still got up and you brushed your teeth, you still had some, some loaves and fishes like Jesus did, you know, still defecated, still took a piss, still did all the things that humans do and everything, but you were just so happy that you could hardly stand on the ground anymore. Uh, still used money. Money could be used, but, but for a way that blessed everyone. So, you know, it wasn't like, like, you didn't have to associate money with greed. A lot of us know, we have met people that are very wealthy, but they're, they have such kind and generous hearts that the love just radiates from them. They're like the, the stewards, the, the, the great givers that, that let the money be used, you know, to, to bless everyone. And we've actually known people too that, that seem to be quite poor, and they complain in their poverty, you know. Why did all these people have more? The government owes me more money, and this and this and this. When Jesus said, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, he was talking about greed. The greed is not going to get you to peace of mind. You're always trying to keep up, protect what you've got or get more. How can you rest in peace if you're so busy? Uh, concerned about money and possessions. He was just saying, if you are peaceful and loving and joyful, you are in the kingdom of heaven. You don't even have to die or go anywhere. You are living the kingdom of heaven in that state of mind. But the form will just get used. And my life's been that way too. I, I get to hug people. I get to hug hundreds and hundreds of people every year in all these different countries. And you know a hug feels good. You know how it is to receive a hug? How good it feels when you receive a hug? Well, giving the hugs, smiling, laughing, giving the hugs, you can just feel this warmth kind of coming through your heart every time you hug someone. And it's good, just like you exercise a muscle. When you exercise the giving and the extending of joy and love and happiness, it grows strong in your awareness. You, know, you grow very strong in it, just like you would exercise a muscle. So. This is the glorious life that all of us are called to, and I would say it's not so much important on what you believe. I mean, people say, well, what is this teaching? Is it Christian? Is it Buddhist? Is it Hindu? Is it Islamic? Uh, is this teaching to do with God or deity, or is it to do more with the present moment? Um, you know, trying to categorize it and classify it and, you know, it's really none of those things in the sense that, that there is no theology that gets you back to the kingdom of heaven. It's not like you get to finally go up to the pearly gates and go, did I get my theology right? There's no, you, you don't get passed through to eternal life because you had the right theology. Even A Course in Miracles is a theology. Even A Course in Miracles is a theology. And there's a part in Lesson 189 where Jesus says, forget this world, forget this course, and come holy empty hands unto your God. I was just at the Course in Miracles conference in San Francisco with 417 other uh, course practitioners, and I got up on my second session. They told me I had to give the same talk twice. I've never done that before in my life, because uh, it's always, I'm waiting to hear what comes out just like everybody else. And I got up there and I said, uh, I am not a Course in Miracles teacher. <laughs> I said to the, the conference, all the people. I just, I like to just be. Uh, I'm not into defending. I'm really grateful for all those many years of working with the Course. And I've read it for eight hours a day, first two and a half years. But I started going to some conferences. And back in 1992, I went to a conference and I was introduced as a walking Course in Miracles encyclopedia. 
There's just nothing that really gets your heart going than being introduced <laughs> as an encyclopedia. You know, that really stirred my heart. It, it did stir my heart, I thought. That's it. I'm, I'm not going to be some like the scribes and the Pharisees and, and know how to quote this book. And literally, I know some of you have worked with the course. I memorized the course. I would go to course groups and, and somebody would start talking about a topic and I'd say, oh yes, the justice of heaven, or I'd, I'd start off with the name of this section and I would literally start verbatim quoting the paragraph, line by line, paragraph by paragraph, and at first they started to laugh, they were going, he's joking, and then they started to look it up and they were like, oh my God, you think your son's obsessive? Do you want to hear a book that's 1,200 pages long, quoted verbatim? Uh, and also, I've been told I have a good memory. <laughs> so, but the thing was, once I got called a walking course of miracles encyclopedia, that was it. I'm not going to be an encyclopedia. I'm not going down in the history books as an encyclopedia. I'm going down in, as joy, as love, as happiness, you know, as being the living presence of of love, not some kind of person that memorized a bunch of uh, scriptures and things. So that's really what my message is for everybody, is that, that we're meant to be the living presence of love. And, and I, I did get to a point where I could see that all of the belief systems of the world always conflicted. I actually got to a point where I saw that no two people see the same world that this world is a trick. No wonder we have so much conflict. It's because no two human beings see the same world. And I, I tell the, the story of like the, the two uh, soulmates that come together after hundreds of lifetimes. They finally meet, they come together, and they're swirling along in ecstasy and joy for two or three months. And one day they're in bed, and then they wake up and they start talking about some topic and the one says to the other, you believe what? Uh, because no two people see the same world. That as you go deeper in forgiveness, you realize that the personality, the person that you think you are, anybody know that you take it back to the Latin, person, persona, persona, mask, we have a holiday called Halloween. This whole world is Halloween. Every person is wearing a mask that's based on the past, that's based on the ego, and then we wonder why do these people have trouble getting along? Why do these masks have trouble agreeing? Because underneath it, when you fall in love with somebody, you're really in for the greatest undoing of the mask that there could ever be. When you hang in there in a relationship and you start to trust and trust, you give yourself permission to lower the mask. And when you start to lower it, the ego inside you screams, be careful, <laughs> keep the defenses up, don't be gullible, don't be stupid. Don't trust too much. Don't let it down too far. Keep your guard up. You know what happened in the past. Remember that time when you lowered your guard? You got torpedoed from the side. You swore you'd never make that mistake again. You would never lower that mask that low again. You would keep your defenses up. And the ego is this voice in your mind that's saying, don't really join even in a love relationship, you know, have, have a good backup plan, have other friends, have, don't, don't tell all your secrets. You know, your secrets, the ego says, can be used against you for gossip, you know, to try to, to really sink you, you know, to really come at you and, and tear you down. And so we have to learn to trust our intuition and to actually go through with lowering the mask and realizing that when we are defenseless, we are safe. When we maintain all of these ego defenses, we are actually
trying to make ourselves safe through inappropriate means that will never make ourselves feel safe. We try it with money in the bank. Money in the bank is security. Even though we have stories of Scrooge, we have stories throughout all the fairy tales that teach us that you can't take it with you. There's even a 1929 movie, if you ever see it, Jimmy Stewart, Lionel Barrymore, you can't take it with you. You want to see a, a 1929 black and white Course in Miracles movie that'll leave you crying. When you see it, just go to the library and look up. You can't take it with you. That's the teachings of the Course in a movie. They did it back then in those black and white movies. <laughs> it's not something a new phenomenon. But, but that movie was teaching that you have to let go of the fear, the greed, all those defenses you have to join together in a higher purpose in order to find happiness and joy. Money, it really, it does a very poor job of protecting you. If, if you think you'll find it through safety, many people during this seeming economic uh, crunch and, and where they lost annuities and stocks and bonds, retirement accounts and this and this, went through an egoic sense of torture because they invested their security in things like stocks and bonds and stock markets and so on and so forth, money, currency, so on, gold, precious metals. This is a precious, I mean, who, who determines that a hunk of this gold material is worth something? It's a rock. <laughs> Ladies and people, it's a rock. It doesn't matter if it's a gold rock or a silver rock, it's just a rock. <laughs> Like that third rock from the sun, you know, it's like, it's just, Earth is just a rock. Let's not get into Mother Nature and Mother Earth and, and concern about the environment. I mean, I had to actually go in my mind and see that the ozone hole layer and the hole in the ozone layer was in my consciousness. There was a big hole <laughs> in my own consciousness that global warming was my own consciousness that was the problem. Uh, I did, the ego invented global warming. Uh, you can get into physics. You know, they, the physicists studied the cosmos and they found out that the cosmos, the physical cosmos, is expanding. And it will continue to expand until it reaches a state of equilibrium and it will reach a state of stillness. And then it will start contracting. And just as the Big Bang exploded, the whole cosmos is going to contract in on itself. It's going to implode. You don't have to be around for that. It's an illusion. It's a dream. You don't have to wait around for quite a few millennium, actually, before that, will, that implosion will happen. Big crunch. Will people be concerned about gold and precious metals uh, when, when the gases and, and the, the rocks that were hurled out into the cosmos start to all kind of kind of implode, almost like a black hole, you know, suck, are sucked together and everything. It's going to take millennium, so you don't have to worry, it's not going to happen in your lifetime. But still, that's not a problem either. Uh, we could say that, that with the Industrial Revolution and with advertising and marketing, we've had an explosion of images. Anybody who watches music videos <laughs> or watches cable TV, there's an explosion of images going on. And people say, is David, is the world getting better or worse? It's an illusion. It's like, how can you have an illusion that's getting better or worse? It's like, to use a multiplication, a, a, a mathematic thing, one times zero is zero. A hundred times zero is zero. A thousand times zero. A million times zero. A trillion times zero is zero. Strawberry fields forever. <laughs> Nothing to get huff about. Strawberry fields. You know, the Beatles. <laughs> uh, you know, there really is nothing to get huff about. But all it takes is just a willingness to realize do not attempt to adjust the dials on your set. They told us in the 1950s when television you know, was invented do not adjust the dials on your set, the voice set. The problem is not in your set. The problem is not in your set. The problem is not in the world. It's not in the nuclear uh, 
proliferation. It's not in the ozone layer. It's not in global warming. It's not in hunger. It's not in equal rights for men or women or children. It can't be found in making better traffic systems, making a better economic system. You cannot improve something that was made as a distracted device. It's like going to the carnival and thinking that you're going to go into the Hall of Mirrors and go and solve your problems in the Hall of Mirrors. You know those mirrors where everything is wavy and distorted and you look in, one mirror you're fat, you look like you're about 800 pounds, the next minute you're as skinny as a pencil, you watch your image in all the mirrors. That's what this world is. You know how many young girls there are in the world that, that think they have weight issues because they just read magazines like Glamour that, that you know, will spit up their food because they think they're putting on too many pounds? You know how many people get suicidal, you know, because they feel like, like they've lost their fortunes. You know, there was a man recently, the billionaire in Germany that committed suicide after the economic collapse. You know, it's like the world is not the problem. It's what we think and believe about the world. It's those distorted perceptions. This, the teenage girl is looking and thinking she's not looking as beautiful as uh, Britney Spears or that she's got too much weight. You know, it's interesting when you listen to talk shows and you hear sometimes women talking about how fat they are and you keep looking at them and going, that's fat? You know, oh, I've got too many pounds on there. I can pinch right here. You know, it's like, that's fat? You know, I mean, we have to look at how distorted the perceptions can be. And for all of us, we can start to say, isn't it great to just get the first hint of the idea that the problem is not in your set? Do not adjust the dial. You may think you can vote in better politicians. They've been trying that for years. Uh, and it's not to say that there aren't symbols of hope. As I go around the world, you know, I've had a lot of people that are very hopeful and optimistic about the new American president and very excited, and there's a stir of, of joy that's happening and everything. But if you listen to, to the political conventions when the politicians are elected, if you just listen to the thoughts that are shared in the political conventions, you can hear some really good stuff. You know, it sounds, uh, uh, we were just talking about that today, um, something that Obama was saying is that, what was it, you can't... If you can't see yourself in the other person, where are we going as a nation? Yeah, if you can't see yourself in the other person, then where are we going as? Tina was jumping up and down, <laughs> calling Liz, going, really the, the, the man who's running for president of the United States or, or is, is speaking from the spirit. You know, it's amazing to see. And yet, if you listen to the political conventions, you hear words like self-sacrifice. We must sacrifice for future generations. You still hear the sacrifice idea that comes in. The same sacrifice idea that was in Catholicism and, you know, in a lot of old theologies. You listen closely at the political conventions, you can still see, hear remnants of this old theology. It's still, the ego is still trying to hang on. But you can bring an end to the ego. In fact, would you like to sing? Little ego? <laughs> Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? Everybody gets ego, it's afraid and trembling of the ego, of, of the devil, of Satan. But we have a song, we have a message about the ego to share here. <laughs> Next time you have a nightmare, just sing this song. <laughs> Got to put the ego in its place. Let me go. 
so alone Let only go Far from home <laughs> Separated, fighting for survival Scared of your own shadow Little ego <laughs> So alone I can see you for what you are, little ego, only a dream. Ego, <laughs> you have no power over me. That's true. Little ego, you are not reality. God is love. 